Hello, hello, hopefully you're joining. Come on in to the prolific webinar. Feel free, hello, I see some hellos in the chat, that's wonderful. Let us know where you're from, type it in there. Uh, I'm coming to you live from Essex, England, from the UK, York, Pittsburgh, excellent, India. So for those of you who are returning attendees or regular attendees to prolific webinars, um, I will be an unfamiliar face to you. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Philip Cozzolino. I uh, got my PhD in social psychology in 2006 at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I was hired in 2006 as assistant professor lecturer at the University of Essex here in England, where I've been for 17 years. I've just started um, working at Prolific this summer as a research consultant and now hosting tonight's webinar. So I am a social psychologist now that I know lovely Turkey, Ontario, Switzerland, beautiful, Florence, oh, jealous. Uh, put in what, so I'm a social psychologist. What do you do? What's your area of research? Let us know where your sort of focus is. Could have multiple foci. Occupational, sensation perception, psycholinguistics, Awesome. Oh, this is great. What a what a group. OK, well, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to our speaker uh, today. Just so you know, there will be the opportunity for you in the chat box throughout the talk to pose questions. Uh, we'll wait till the end of the talk to sort of go through the questions that we can in the time frame that we have. We'll try to stay around that 6 p.m. endpoint British time. Um, and of course, if there are questions that are unanswered, we'll have uh, offline answers sent to you in an email once the uh, webinar is over. You'll get that email, email with a link to the recording of it within uh, 24 hours or so of, of us ending. So you'll get your questions answered uh, either live today or in the email later. So today we're going to be hearing from Kaspar Guka, who is the co-founder, CEO, managing director of LabVanced. LabVanced is a, a, a really great platform to do all kinds of research that traditionally people think would be difficult to do with online so samples like us at Prolific. Uh, Kaspar got his PhD at the University of Osnabrück in Germany in cognitive science with a major focus on human navigation. Uh, LabVanced, which he's gonna be stepping us through uh, their platform today and research that you can do there, really does allow for some interesting complex physiological research, uh, eye tracking, pulse measurement, emotion detection, all of which can be linked up to crowdsourcing platforms like Prolific to get your online participants to do these very traditional physiological measurements uh, and assessments. So uh, with that said, let me introduce you not from England, but all the way around the globe in Bangkok, Thailand, Kaspar Guka. Yeah, thank you, Philip, so much for the introduction. Uh, really nice there, and uh, hello everyone. Yeah, I'm really a remote data collection enthusiast, and so yeah, to today I would like to talk about best practices and cutting edge technologies in remote data collection. And uh, Philip already introduced uh, me a little bit, um, just a few more words. So yeah, I'm Kasper Gurka, um, CEO and co-founder of the LabVans platform. Um, yeah, I got my PhD in, uh, in cognitive science with a, with a focus on uh, human navigation, EEG, eye tracking. But over the last couple of years, I also really worked a lot on web technologies. Uh, of course, comes with remote data collection efforts. Um, I'm leading our team and um, you know, I'm still kind of active in the research space. So you see this a little bit here. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, let's move on because there are quite a few things to cover today. So a um, uh, bit about our company. Uh, our company focuses on advanced methods for online data collection efforts. LabVance is our main product, which I'm going to talk about today, and uh, all kind of methods you can you can use to make this really really interesting. Um, we're quite active with research partnerships, of course, here with Prolific, but also with a couple of other companies, and we are also active in research ourselves. So uh, we, are, we are funded by uh, European uh, uh, research grants. German research grants, but also others you see here, MyTax, which is a Canadian one. And yeah, we were quite active in research and uh, development and in pushing quite of really the methods forward. All right, so uh, the topics that I would like to talk about today is really um, uh, yeah, relevant topics for uh, remote research. And uh, we're currently drafting actually a, a white paper about this. And we 
segregated this into kind of five domains or five different topics, uh, which I would like to talk about today. To uh, you know, cover all of this would probably take a, in, in all the depths, uh, but maybe take a bit too long. So I try to kind of make it shorter, and uh, the first three topics will be a bit fa uh, quicker, and the the two uh, last topics a, a bit more in depth because I think they're most interesting and uh, yeah, deserve the most time. So I start with precision, which is um, of course very important for a lot of uh, data collection efforts, and uh, mostly on timing precision today. Uh, then I talk a bit about uh, GDPR, which is not a boring topic, but actually can be quite uh, technical. So data privacy, how you can make your data collection efforts really uh, you know, private and secure. Um, ease of implementation, which is then the third topic, which is all about how actually, um, what are you know, the distinguishing factors to make uh, an implementation easy and you know, fast and, and really uh, you know, not a nice experience in a way. And um, then the, the topics I talk a bit more today is experimental control, which I personally find really, really interesting because a lot more um, is possible than maybe a couple of years ago. So uh, you know, bringing really the control back to research, which um, traditionally thought uh, is not possible online. And then um, as a kind of highlight, really physiological data recordings was a major focus on eye tracking. So uh, I start with precision. And um, so, this, especially with timing precision, so where it's about how stimuli can present can be presented most accurately in time. That means, uh, you know, the knowing exactly when your stimulus is on the screen of the participant, when it disappears, but also measuring reaction times really precisely. And there are a couple of things that need to be uh, should be considered here. So first, and this is not something special to uh, experimental platforms like ours, is uh, called preloading or basically caching the stimuli. So if you present images, audio files, video files, anything like this, um, this is of course fetched from an internal, uh, external server, so from some other, uh, uh, you know, server on the internet. And uh, the first thing that should be done is uh, preloading this. That means before the experiment starts, or at least before the stimulus is shown, this. Uh, should be cached in the browser or, and then uh, finally in the application. And this, of course, is going to happen. And a lot of platforms work like this, and this is, of course, essential so that the stimuli then are shown very precisely and quickly. Uh, the next thing that is uh, to say, then the next level, which is a bit unique uh, for us as an online platform, and it's kind of inspired by uh, what uh, Psych Toolbox uh, in, you know, uh, did or, or implemented like many years ago, which we call pre rendering. And you can kind of think about it like, um, if you uh, have an experimental uh, task where, let's say, you have a couple of trials, and in those trials, you let's say, show different things. Let's say, first, you have a fixation cross, and then two images, for instance. And you can think of this, these are different frames. And uh, in like Toolbox, this thing is called frame buffer. And so similarly, what we do, essentially, is we, uh, if you, let's say, in trial number five of your experiment, then all the frames of trial number five, but also all the frames of trial number six are pre-rendered. And that basically just means all the HTML is already created. They're just kind of stacked behind each other. Um, so you have a stack of frames that already exist. And then when, let's say, there's a button press and then a new frame should be shown, then you can just move another thing into the front instead of just creating it on the fly. And this makes it much faster. Uh, yeah, then just creating it on the fly, right? And so um, this is another technique uh, that 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 helps to really make stimulus really precise. Um, however, that's not it. There are still kind of variants that needs to be measured. And uh, one of the important things here is actually the uh, monitor or screen refresh rate. And as we know, screens actually have refresh rates. Most screens have 60 hertz refresh rate, which means they have a new uh, image basically every 16.6 milliseconds. And so if you... Um, Let's say you know press a button and you know some code is executed, and you want to let's say uh, you know a stimulus should disappear, um, but your screen just refreshed five milliseconds ago. That means it will still anyway take eleven milliseconds because your screen is not going to change its refresh rate just because you know some code is executed. So one has to actually uh, take into account the delay of the refresh rate, and there is a certain function you can do that, and you know we we yeah we account for that, let's say, and, and, and so correct for this delay. And then the final thing to consider here is actually the speed of JavaScript, or in general, it's a bit great, the speed of your computer, because the way this works with uh, you know, single thread JavaScript and the event loop, all kind of complicated things, essentially is that when you want to show a stimulus for 100 milliseconds, what basically happens is a function is created, and you tell the function, OK, call me back in 100 milliseconds. 
But what happens is that because your computer could be a bit slow, that this callback just happens in 1 milliseconds or 103 or 105. And there's nothing much you can do about it. It depends a bit on the computer speed. But what you can do, is you can measure this. You can measure this delay, I mean, on each average trial. And what we do per se is just like measure it as an average across the whole recording session. And then you can correct for this again and uh, you know, account for this in the analysis. If you want to know more about all the kind of precision methods uh, you know, that, that are happening, actually, this is a review not from us, from a complete uh, external party. Um, and I think it's a really excellent review. So um, you, know, you could uh, go on and read, read about this a bit more. Let's go to the next topic, which is actually GDPR and uh, data privacy. And uh, so the way I would like to present us here is actually, um, there's a lot about, we could talk about this here. Um, we or like I identified for this talk here actually again like five topics which I find interesting and then like I say kind of how this is like working in advanced and uh, you know how yeah how we kind of do this. First topic that you should always think about when you uh, you know uh, you know are in the EU or in the US I guess everywhere where data data privacy is really important. You should think where your data is stored and how it's processed. Um, and um, you know I can say for us all the data is located on servers in the EU. Uh, we also uh, getting a new data center in the US soon. So, you know, that's just a, a major topic. Always be aware where, where the data is stored and processed. Second very important thing is the relevancy of the data recording. That means um, you really should think about like what kind of data is actually recorded from the participant. So let's say um, if you use a tool and you know you want to record reaction times and other cho other choices of the participant, you have to make sure that you know the, the platform doesn't you know, record anything else as a participant on just the thing that you actually uh, want to record. And again, for us, we can say, uh, you know, we really don't track anything as participants. We only record what you want to record, but nothing else. And, and this is, I think, uh, important here. Um, third thing to say here is uh, certification. Of There are, you know, a lot of online platforms, not only in the experiment space, but in general. And I guess most or every platform would say they're secure. Uh, you know, the, the, the GDPR compliant, et cetera, but not everybody goes the step of actually doing a certification. Like a, what I mean with that is like a third party audit or uh, yeah, a sort of, a sort of uh, certification. So we went through this process and actually we are ex, uh, external verified with a vulnerability and penetration test, test which is a certain type of test uh, that tests for any loopholes in our system. And, you know, we passed this and, you know, we're kind of proud of this because it really shows that our security is strong. Uh, fourth step is encryption. Especially, and I'm coming to this a bit later, when you uh, record very private data of the participant, like video recordings, audio recordings, uh, um, you know, screen recordings, um, this kind of data, um, it's questionable whether it's you know a good idea to to just uh, you know upload this to any server anywhere unencrypted, because you know things can always happen, uh, no matter how strong the security is, right? So actually. Uh, the best way to do handle this is actually a true end-to-end -end encryption, which basically means, like, let's say a video is encrypted on the participant's device directly, and only the encrypted format goes to, uh, let's say, our server. And only, only, uh, you know, after you download it, you can decrypt it again uh, on 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 your uh, yeah on your data center on your server. Um, so that's that's another I think really important part if depending on the type of data that you're recording. And then finally, and uh, kind of the most advanced thing that you can do is there's also the possibility that you can actually store the data directly from the participant's device to your own data center, to your own machine, to your own, yeah, to your own servers, and not even you know, uh, using or uh, uh, sending this to any advanced uh, server at all. And there are some use cases, some bigger research organizations or companies who, who really appreciate this possibility that, you know, like, uh, while you know Lefanz is a really great platform for for creating all this kind of uh, research, um, there is just like some compliance reason that participant data can never be stored outside their system, and that also works. Okay, there, I'm sure there's more topic about GDPR, but I want to move uh, forward here. So uh, next topic that I like to talk about is the ease of implementation, because of course, uh, in the end. All of this uh, is very interesting, but in the end, uh, it's it's all important that it's convenient, right, uh, to to create these kind of studies. And um, so, the way I would like to kind of maybe you to think about this, like uh, what does it mean convenience and what are different options? It's not a much like that I compare our platform not to other platforms, you know, compare products here, but more general, uh, you know, types of implementations you can do. 
So um, when you think about like how you could uh, realize an online uh, study or uh, remote, remote data collection effort, the first uh, thing that you could do is, of course, you could program it. You could basically use a code solution, uh, PsychoPy, uh, PsychoPy, uh, PsychJS, other kind of uh, you know free uh, available tools and and, uh, and programming language that you can use. And when you think about pros and cons. Um, those things are like those programming languages, of course, very powerful, very flexible. You you can do a lot, um, um, so that's that's a really strong thing. Um, you can you can use JavaScript and you know go start from scratch to say that's also possible. Um, but on the con side, this is very difficult for most people as you know, as working in uh, psychology, cognitive science, uh, marketing, but you know also like IT or other areas like. Creating all of this from scratch, just with to say uh, code, is is kind of difficult and takes a long time and might be not worth the effort, so to say. Um, also, another problem that we exp I personally experienced in my own institution when I was a PhD student, there's limited reusability. We had like I don't know, I think about 25 scripts <laughs> uh, of kind of the same experiment because it's really hard to reuse a script from somebody else or you know even sometimes of yourself like five years in the past. So reusing code effectively and uh, it's not so easy and, and if you just do it just to say study by study uh, and finally of course if you do very ad try to do very advanced things like working based eye tracking um, it's it's very unlikely that it's worth to program this for just one experiment right so um, yeah there are some there are some uh, cons as well the second solution you can think about here is kind of more like a template based approach and what I mean with that is so there are some tools and solution that Let's say you want to do a two alternative first choice task. So you know, subject C, let's say two types of text or two images, and uh, and this template basically, you know, provides that and just asks you to, okay, please upload your stimuli. Please, you know, provide your images. Please provide your text, maybe as a CSV file or so. And that's great. Uh, you know, that's probably the easiest solution you can think of to create these studies because you just provide your stimuli and it's kind of done. However, what is the con is that there's limited flexibility. Let's say you want to show one image a bit delayed than the other, or you want to play a sound at top of it. You want to show a fixation cross. You know, there are so many endless possibilities, literally, like that I see every day. That template-based approaches or pure, like rigid template-based approaches, are really, really difficult. And you know, very soon you, you hit boundaries with that. Um, so, what is the third option here? Um, the third option here is to use a visual or low code editor like LabVanced. And what's the difference is that, well, um, while it's it, it's it's still a you know can use templates and it's still a visual, um, it's also really very flexible and powerful. So what you can see here, for instance, is uh, our uh, you know uh, yeah our platform, and you see here basically a frame and different elements that are put on this frame, and you could just sort of say click and drag and drop uh, images, videos, text, all in this frame, you could modify it differently per trial. And it's it's intuitive because um, you know you directly see what the participant will see. And this is, a, I think, a very important principle also in other types of software. So you directly see what, what you're making. And uh, at the same time, uh, this, it goes a bit to the depths, but like, for instance, using our event system and all of this, you can do build any logic that's possible. So in the end, um, I think the pro here is clearly that um, it's a best trade-off between uh, you know being flexible, easy to use, and powerful. So, so in a way, I think uh, you know load code platform like ours um, are uh, you know that's that's a pro. What is the con? Yeah, there are cons, and uh, the con side of it is it actually has very high development and maintenance cost because you one has to build all of this functionality, one has to maintain all of this functionality. So, uh, if there is a downside, then this this uh, is a potential downside. But what really, uh, you know, I, I clearly conclude here is that this principle of what you uh, see is what you get uh, really makes implementation uh, the most, yeah, most easy. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, another short add-on to ease of implementation. Uh, you should consider support because, um, yeah, obviously I'm, you know, dealing and talking to a lot of people and um, in the space, and um, it's just a fact that support is important like no matter actually if you are a programmer then you'll probably um you know find your support by you know googling things going to stack overflow uh, maybe you have a, a buddy or like some other colleagues um if you use a platform like ours it's important that you get different types of support 
um, you know, there's uh, live chat support, uh, support calls with actually, you know, experts in psychology who can advise. Um, another, I think, important thing in terms of support is actually how do you get data? Because, um, you know, it's not really clear to everyone. Obviously, we're here with Prolific, so uh, I guess everybody knows obviously here about Prolific, uh, but not everybody uh, who comes to say uh, to us directly knows about this this possibility and how to actually recruit data. And so, actually, it's important that you know we offer this also to users to actually recruit data for them, and use Prolific always for this. So, actually, having having this uh, clearly integrated as uh, as, a, as a tool is also very important. And then finally, of course, webinars. Uh, you know video text documentation, all of this I think is really important when you consider like which platform to use and you know, in general like the support is, is really an important aspect of this. Okay, um, yeah, I think we're good in time. So um, then, uh, yeah, the uh, first more in-depth topic is experimental control. And um, so I divide actually this up into two sections the first section about experimental control and it has a lot to do with like, technologies and how uh, you know how can this can be realized today is about controlling the hardware and the presentation of the experiment of study at hand and so we're kind of going through uh, through this uh, you know in a, in a list style and of course in the q a we can also discuss some details here um, so the first thing that you could do is of course uh, uh, is it the type of control is a device uh, and you can of course specify on which device your study should run. And for all these measures, I should also say you can always uh, measure it, you know, just as a covariate and, you know, count for this in your, in your analysis, or you can require it, meaning you can only choose, okay, I only want Android devices, so I only want iOS devices, um, or I only want, you know, uh, a certain operating system. Um, so all of this, uh, you know, can be, can be uh, controlled and measured, which is, which is quite important in some cases. Uh, the next type of control, it's a bit different, it's a screen. It's not exactly the device, but the screen, because there are a couple of peculiarities uh, regarding the screen and also a, a few modern techniques to, to uh, control this. The first thing, and I'm going to show this later in the example, is actually you can control the, uh, or you can measure and then also control, well, in, in a sense, uh, yeah, control uh, the physical screen size of the subjects, um, because Typically, you only get this in pixels, but with a little trick, you can actually determine how large the, the you can measure how large the screen is of the participant, and then also require you know a, a minimum width or a maximum width of the screen. You can also measure the distance of the participant to the screen, which is another important aspect, especially in a lot of uh, uh, studies in which is dealing with visual stimuli and visual signs, where actually you know the the size of the stimulus on the retina is is important. So um, so you can actually, to a certain degree, there's some variance here about 10% actually, but to a certain extent, you can measure the participant's screen distance. And you can of course, of course also measure and determine the refresh rate of the monitor, which is another important variable here. Then um, presentation. So actually, uh, this relates a bit to the, to the former point um, of the screen size. So, in, in in depending on how you want to set up your study, it's possible, and that's the default actually in, in our platform, is that the stimulus size is dynamic. That means we always uh, respect the aspect ratio. But uh, you know, if you have a large screen, like things scale large, and if you have a small phone, things scale to small, and it just looks always, so to say, nice in the same ratio on every device. So no matter like what the device, it always looks nice and always looks good, and and that makes sense for a lot of studies. However. Uh, not for every study, because for some, again, visual science related uh, studies, it might make sense that you say you want to sh ha have the stimulus size more like defined in millimeters, like for every subject. So basically you have to scale it differently uh, based on the, um, you know, differently for every subject. And basically if you know the physical screen size and you measure that, then it's, it's an option or platform to basically change this, so to say, per uh, per device or per subject. So the stimuli are really fixed in millimeters. And in addition to that, even like one, one, one more thing you can do, if you also calculate the screen distance, you can even fix it in visual degrees, which basically you need the distance to the screen and the, the screen size, and then you can fix your stimuli actually even in visual degrees and make it you know, uh, very much as a, as a lot of lab, lab uh, setups are doing. 
OK, let's move on. So uh, the next thing you can do, of course, is um, require sensors, which you know we need for eye tracking, for audio video recording, so you can measure whether there's a webcam available, a microphone available. And you can also measure whether the participants wear headphones. Uh, there have been, I think, at least two kind of more fam kind of famous publications in the space in the last couple of years, and they work very well. And you can you can use uh, templates for this in our platform if you want to do uh, you know do uh, yeah experiments with auditory stimuli. This might be quite important to know or even determine that people have to wear headphones. Um, then uh, there's a couple of checks for data quality. Uh, one thing uh, you can do, especially for the eye tracking, which uh, you can determine the frame rate of the webcam. And this wasn't possible, uh, believe it or not, until like a couple of months ago. But now this is uh, very well possible. And you can, uh, again, determine and require a certain uh, ref uh, refresh rate. And some webcams even have 60 hertz uh, uh, frames today. Um, OK, and the last thing here in terms of hardware and presentation is, uh, and I mentioned this in the in the other topic, is actually you can measure, and we do this automatically, the speed of the event loop, the JavaScript speed, and how much delays in the system. And again, use it as a covert or even excluding subjects. OK, so that has been the topic of you know hardware and uh, 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 hardware hardware requirements. Then the other you know side of the coin is, in a way, controlling the participant and the environment of the participant. And the first, and in this case, maybe more, most important aspect here is actually the demographics, like who is taking part in your study. And of course, here, prolific uh, plays a major role, uh, or the, the most important role, because prolific has hundreds of uh, pre-screeners that you can use. And you know these are just fantastic uh, to really you know, customize who can take part in your study. Uh, this, is, this is really important, I guess, for you know, almost every kind of research. Um, and then again, related to presentation, what you can actually do, you can force a subject, or you know, you do that again, force the subject to, uh, to 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 run this the experiment in full screen mode. And uh, while technically they can leave the full screen by pressing escape, you can then pause the study or even abort the study. And you can tell the subject just don't leave the full screen mode. So you can kind of force the subject to you know do it in one go and not like do something else. You know, th things could happen otherwise. Um, and general good practices, and you know, of course, you could check much more details here. But gamification is good if you, you know, have kind of, uh, you know, longer studies where uh, you know you could just earn some points and and you make it kind of fun to go through uh, something. Uh, maybe where it's just like a lot of trials and you can earn points and you may even make like maybe a dynamic reward based on that. Um, practice trials are really important for like complicated stuff like you know end back uh, uh, tasks or anything that's kind of cognitively demanding. And you know, people might not familiar with that, so that you know, actually uh, train the people a little bit and actually make sure they actually pass the training before you go into the real trials. That's actually another thing that a lot of people miss. And bot checks um, for a lot of like the typical cognitive tasks, it's it's in our experience not 100% uh, uh, relevant because they are so so say human complex that normal bots will not do this, but there are these auto-forming trials. So if you have an auto-forming trial, I mean, you show stimulus for 100 milliseconds and it just moves on and you know you could answer or not. If you have those kind of experiments, you, you should definitely do a bot check and you know do a little little check that you know like not just uh, you know a bot is doing that. Although I know that Prolific does a, you know you know all they can do and you know the data is really great, but nevertheless, I think in those cases it makes sense to to implement a short short bot check here. Um, yeah, um, then again, like uh, topics regarding data quality. So uh, regarding the participant, uh, and I think for us and all our data collection efforts, it's it's kind of uh, important that uh, there's this incentive in Prolific that if the participant doesn't give good data, so there's like some rare cases where let's say a participant you know, flex a study to be completed, but he hasn't even started it. <laughs> and, and there are some funny cases where I said, oh, yeah, I just wanted to do it later. And, you know, like, it's actually good that, uh, you know, I, I guess the way this works is that if participants do this again and again, they will guess, you know, they will get less jobs to do. And so it's a it's a self-regulating system where, you know, only really good, good subjects, you know, remain. So that's really important and good. Um, some more advanced things you can do regarding participant environment. So we have our eye tracking and part of the eye tracking is actually hat tracking you will see this in a bit um, and um, some pretty much good in time I think and so you still see this basically uh, you know how the hat tracking works and what the hat tracking basically does yeah it tracks the hat and you can basically 
uh, see whether actually a human is in front of the screen, but you can also see whether the human is the, the human hat is just sort of say focusing like on the screen. Uh, and this doesn't require any calibration compared to the eye tracking. So that's a really nice, uh, and you can just passively record this all the time. Um, and then finally, of course, you can do screen recordings, audio recordings to check for any disturbances in the environment. So you can see like what does the participant actually see on the screen? Was there any noise in the environment? Uh, this is also possible. Okay, so let's uh, do a summary here. So with such modern te uh, technologies, remote data collection can be highly controlled in terms of experiments device, uh, presentation, the participant uh, engagement, and um, the environment in which the recording takes place. Uh, when applying all these techniques, uh, a lot of potential variance in the data can be reduced uh, while maintaining a high level of uh, ecological validity. And this, again, uh, leads to more correct and precise conclusions uh, that we can derive from the data, obviously. Um, now to the last topic, um, which is physiological data recordings. And um, so first, maybe a statement here. So I think a lot of us maybe in this call would agree that you know, online research has seen a lot of adoption in recent years. However, most studies still limit themselves to only behavioral measures. And it's kind of our mission to change that a little bit. And um, so during the last four years, our team wrote and continues actually to improve um, our own deep learning webcam eye tracking uh, solution. And um, yeah, this of course, you know, could require an own uh, webinar in itself, but in short, the way this works I already teased this a little bit. So it starts with hat detection, so we should track the hat. Then uh, we will, you know, find the eyes in the hat, crop the eye images, also know the hat orientation. This is then feed into the neural network together with a customized calibration. I guess quite a few have seen eye tracking calibration where you see these dots. Otherwise, I would show this to you also. And yeah, this is how it's essentially working. And the overall accuracy of our system is actually 1.3 visual degrees, which um, compared to like a public available thing, which is WebGazer JS is about three times as accurate. Um, Fair thing to say, Web, uh, WebGazer.js is not a deep learning approach. It's a bit an older kind of uh, logistic regression. So it's also no wonder why it's much better in a way. Nevertheless, I think this shows kind of the kind of improvement that we're we are showing here. And uh, actually, a peer review, uh, sorry, a comparison study with an Arling system is currently on a peer review. And you know, keep fingers crossed that this is out soon so we can actually show much more data to everyone. So now I would like to show a little video about this. And uh, now just in the sake of time, I would just start this. And so this shows a little bit how the eye tracking is working. And I hope this is uh, you know, interesting to everyone. So essentially, and I skip this, try to make it faster a little bit here. You can, in advance, essentially, yeah, you know, drag and drop all your uh, stimuli there. And you know, this can all be AOIs. Because for uh, eye tracking, it's of course very important to know where your stimuli in relation to the eye data. Just enable the eye tracking. And then you get your data. And uh, the important thing that I want to show you is really how it's done for the participant. How does this essentially work and look like? And so when an experiment starts, um, what you basically see is, uh, you know, this is again me here. Um, the participant sees themselves. Uh, actually, I removed my glasses, right? The one thing is that you shouldn't have a lot of uh, you know, reflection on your glasses. So uh, that's why I removed them. Now you see the actually hat tracking and how accurate this this hat thing, uh, this hat tracking is. Um, I explain a little bit what this green uh, mesh means, but essentially I'm asked to position myself in the center, and now I just see a typical eye tracking calibration where I look at these different dots, like you know one by one, and and um, and that's it. Now. Um, Virtual chin rest. This is one of the very innovative technologies that we developed because one of the big problems with webcam or like in general with eye tracking, even in the lab, are actually hat movements. If you move your hat a lot, the data essentially gets bad. And uh, this is even worse for webcam-based eye tracking because, well, with RGB or with a the camera, then it doesn't find the eye. And obviously, if you don't find the eye, well, the data is not good. So um, what we essentially developed is Similar to what you have in the lab of like this, this actually physical chin rest where people are like asked to really put their chin on the on the on a physical thing, um, it's a virtual chin rest. So people are enforced to keep the hat in the same position in 3D space, and so to say the way this works is that you first when the study starts you are asked to uh, you know lock in this virtual chin rest, and then if you move out of it. Then essentially, you know, in this case, the study will interrupt. There are different modes. You can also disable that. But essentially, for a lot of tasks, it makes sense to just stop, ask the subject to realign. And yeah, so how does the data look like? 
well for uh, you know uh, this is in the beginning mostly raw data x and y coordinates of the i there's a precise time stand also a confidence interval um, but yeah we uh, and you can of course do force fixation so uh, gaze contingent paradigms because this is um, uh, in real time uh, yeah but also any other kind of paradigms oops and I actually sorry right um, what type of data you get? Um, you get gaze data, as I showed you, like raw gaze data, fixation data. So we have our own fixation algorithm, um, you know, AOIs and trajectories. And uh, seeing a bit of time here. So what we did, and I want to show to you this, uh, this to you quickly, is we did this comparison study. And it's, so to say, a, a test battery about uh, our eye tracking. And uh, there are a couple of tasks. One is actually the typical grid task, where people are essentially looking at, Again, obviously at the screen, and the stimulus is kind of disappearing, and subject has to pre have to press a button when the stimulus is disappearing. The way why this? Because then we exactly know that subject actually attended, and uh, we did measure data simultaneously from iLink and from our system. And uh, so uh, the results are here. So I think we had about twenty subjects in the end, and um, well, of course the iLink system is better. It's a ten thousand. Uh, your system or roughly that and um, but our system is only about 0 0.5 visual degrees so about also 0 0.5 centimeters worse than the Arling system which is I think a fantastic result and you know also for some subjects it was actually remarkably similar um, we did also then test some other types of paradigms so a smooth pursuit uh, task where people just follow a dot and we calculated some uh, correlation uh, coefficients, uh, Pearson correlation, and uh, as you can see here, the data is super highly correlated with um, an R of about, you know, uh, bigger than uh, 0 0.9. It depends a bit on the vertical and the horizontal component, but it's overall very highly correlated. And then, you know, similarly, just again, also we did a free viewing task, which I guess maybe a lot of you supposedly are doing. Uh, of course, it depends on type of research where you just show stimulus, you know, freely and people can explore it. Um, and we did as well, and again uh, calculated kind of a heat map, and you can see actually the, you know, the the predictions fall pretty much on the same spot. You would drive the same conclusions from both systems, and also the uh, the correlation is uh, you know similar to us in the smooth pursuit above 90 percent, so which is really really nice. Now the last thing I want to say here, just jumping a bit forward, um, so um, kind of a summary here um, is. So with webcam-based eye tracking, with modern webcam-based eye tracking, as in our uh, platform, um, you can get real-time gaze and fixation data. Um, you know, it's highly accurate or you know, remarkably accurate with about 1.2 to 1.4 visual degrees of accuracy. Um, one thing I haven't been able to say because it you know also sort of time constraints you a little bit. Actually, this is um, also very innovative because all the uh, inference of the eye tracking, also machine learning, actually is happening on the participant's device, on the client's device. Why that? Because this is GDPR compliant. We are not sending any images or videos to our servers. This is happening all locally with a lot of advanced uh, WebGL and uh, uh, yeah, techniques, so a lot of uh, and parallel threads and a lot of, so to say, uh, highly advanced uh, techniques to make it private. Because the other option would be to just basically send and stream all of these you know, faces essentially to a server and, and let it process it. But in our times and also like a lot of customers we speak, this would violate essentially a lot of privacy rules and, and would not be acceptable. So this all happened locally and only the, you know, gaze location, which is essentially anonymous data is then sent to, uh, to, a, to a server. Uh, we also have for people who are working in development psychology, which is actually quite a large group uh, for us, um, we have an infant friendly mode, which is pretty funny because, uh, well, uh, or interesting because, you know, the calibration is actually then, uh, uh, you know, quacking uh, 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 frogs and, you know, like something that makes actually a, a child attend and it works kind of really well. Um, so, yeah, if you work in that space also, uh, yeah, let, let, let us know. Um, and so all over, again, like a, a white, uh, paper or comparison study is uh, currently under peer review. Uh, and, and we conclude here really that about 85 to 90% of current eye tracking research can be carried out with our system. OK, um, yep. Yeah. So let me summarize that. So with today's advancement in AI technologies, data gathered for online research can be enriched 
binds that full physiological data recordings, eye tracking being kind of the most important example here. Um, the advanced remote eye tracking technology uh, to us is clearly leading in terms of accuracy, feature completeness, and also being secure and uh, privacy uh, centric. With all its features and also strong, really data quality, Prolific is also really the best choice for recording this type of data. We also, you know, of course, checked, but you know, it's very clear like you need a very good, uh, you know, uh, participants and very good plat platform for this. So, um, you know, definitely go with Prolific here. And a short call for participation here: if you have already done eye tracking with us or planning to do so in the future, please let us know why. Because actually, um, we will be gathering Prolific IDs. From like which are anonymous, right? From subjects which which you know deliver good eye tracking data, we will make this as public available to everyone, so that in the future researchers have even you know, easy access to good subjects. Because what still happens sometimes is that you know the success rate of calibration just maybe sixty percent or so. So you know we want to give uh, push this to like 80, 90 percent by by doing this. All right. Um, so now uh, we have a short poll. I think presentation is like besides a short uh, demonstration uh, coming towards an end. And uh, so uh, yeah, here is a poll, and I would like to ask you which topics uh, you know we find most relevant for your next kind of online study that you're planning. Uh, and um, I think we already prepared this poll here. So Kirsten, please maybe uh, pull up that poll. And you know, like over the next you know couple of minutes, you can just uh, vote. And uh, you know, yeah, please please do so. I'm just uh, moving on to the next slide again in terms of time. Uh, but yeah, please, please vote. It would be super, super helpful for us and everybody to know that essentially. So now advanced and prolific, which is uh, kind of my final uh, slide here. Um, so how uh, do we use and why do we use prolific? Um, we use prolific ourselves, you know, for collecting, for instance, eye tracking data, for eye track for our training data. But we also run many customer studies and help people, you know, set, setting this up. Uh, this year alone, I think we collected over 7,000 data sets in about 10 studies which I think is quite significant. Um, compared to other tools, Prolific really has proven really excellent uh, data quality and great support you know, in case there's anything. you know, It's, it's, it's good and, and nice to reach out. And as I said, import, support is always important in, in any case. Um, and the most important features that we are using is actually um, the, all these pre-screeners and you know, demographic selection uh, criteria. That's really excellent, really, really nice. And also the, the other kind of Thing that maybe not so many people are aware of, but I think uh, for us, kind of really important actually is the uh, the option to run longitudinal studies with automatic reminders. And I'm going to show you now in the last uh, two minutes. I don't have much time. Um, how we're going to use this? So I'm going to share a very quick study. It's going to be a bit quick, but we should have enough time for Q and A. Um, this is actually I'm just going to uh, hack this. Um, if you know runs on prolific, people will not see the screen because their prolific ID will be read out. I'm just going to you know. This is a bit faster than usual. And you see also how the eye tracking works. And you know, of course, it accesses now my webcam. I have another webcam stream, so it takes a few seconds to uh, initialize this. But then I should be seeing my face, and I do. And it should be good. Um, so as you can see, here is my face. I say this works well. OK, uh, start. So now what I have to do, I have to do the screen calibration. And uh, the little trick that I showed that I teased before is essentially all these cards. It doesn't need to be a credit card. This is just my logical macro card. And now I hold this onto the screen, and I basically change the slider to match the size of my card because all the cards have the same size everywhere, even where I live here right now. That basically tells me now like how large the screen is. Now, here comes the eye tracking calibration. So I go through this a bit quicker. But essentially, I, I fix my center post here. So I say, OK, this pose is comfortable. And now you see, if I'm moving out of this pose, I have to move back to start. So now I do this. Now I have to actually do the little calibration here. So I look at these dots one by one. Obviously, in terms of experimental control, it's not great to give a webinar while doing an eye tracking calibration. Uh, OK, so we're done. Now uh, there's a short uh, um, calculation step, basically uh, calculating the weights of the neural network. And it uh, should be done in a few seconds. Now uh, you know, now comes the actual study. And I tell some basic what to do. So this is a linguistic study. And I, I shouldn't move my hat. Essentially, it will basically uh, 
show me a sentence. And then uh, there are two options how to complete the sentence. So I'll just start this. So essentially, it will uh, do something like this. So uh, fixation cross, we drink coffee most often in the, and I can complete it now in two ways, morning and evening, typically in the morning, and so on. So uh, and I'm, no, we do eye tracking and mouse tracking here. And um, essentially, the idea is so it's, it's, a, it's a longitudinal study, and it's a replication of an existing study we did for larger clients, so in a, in a simplistic way. Um, uh, but the idea is that I choose one of these words, and then in the second session, um, I'm basically asked uh, which, which words I saw. So it's a, it's a memory uh, paradigm. So I think I should be almost done here. And you see how you know easily I just yeah, continue. All right, so perfect. Now I can start the next session. Um, and it's gonna skip there. It's also the last feature. Um, two three minutes over time. Gonna be okay. Um, so, so next session usually, of course, this uh, there would be a delay of about a day. This could be exactly timed and controlled. And the nice thing that you can do here, I don't have to go through the calibration again. Uh, which is uh, nice because I just did this and this is locally saved. Of course, this only works if you uh, want this to work. So I can just use my previous calibration data and um, probably not going to do the whole thing to save a little bit of time here. But essentially what you will see here is, again, we do an eye tracking on the second session. Uh, I see welcome back and we get instructed um, what what I have to do. And then I'm presented just with basically two words. And one of the words was I, uh, you know, I, I was shown before and the other one I wasn't. And uh, the question is, of course, uh, how is my gaze behavior and uh, mouse behavior affected by this? So it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a simplistic uh, reproduction of something that we did before. Uh, now, uh, yeah, let's wrap this up. Um, so yeah, um, this is an example study. Um, you can also uh, use this as a uh, as a study uh, as a template. Uh, but yeah, that that has been the webinar. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I hope this was really interesting. If you you know want to uh, get in touch, get in touch. Thank you. All right, Casper, thank you so much for that. I want to, in the remaining uh, 12 minutes that we have, I want to jump to some of the questions. Thank you for the talk. Thank you for the demonstration. Um, it's amazing how far eye tracking online has come in, in such a short amount of time. A couple of questions that a few people seem to have asked uh, uh, reading through them, it basically um, multiple questions uh, is, uh, uh, do you have pupil dilation measures as part of your eye tracking modules? Um, going, I've, been, I've, prepared, I've prepared a little bit. Uh, let me go to the, OK, that's <laughs> animated. Uh, the last slide. <laughs> so actually, <laughs> uh, we're working on this. That's a short. So we, we it's currently not, uh, so to say, available in the uh, in a production environment. But we're working it. And there's been this really interesting paper by Mazziotti uh, et al. Uh, uh, recently in 2021, which uh, you know, uh, who showed that this actually can be uh, can be done. And uh, we're quite confident that we can improve on this, uh, especially given kind of the better and higher quality webcams and uh, you know, kind of because you need a lot of uh, computer power and uh, GPU power essentially to, to process all of this. So uh, short answer, we work on this. Uh, get back in a year and I hope you have a production uh, ready system there. I'm not sure it's possible that you answered this question um, while you were doing the talk. Uh, this comes from Bianca. So I sense you can measure approximate DVA retroactively, but can you make the software automatically adjust it so that all participants are seeing a certain stimuli as, exactly. for example, 15 degrees Exactly. DVA? That's exactly what happens. That's exactly what it does. Okay. I had a feeling you may have answered Sorry, that I, in the I, talk I, as well. Yes. That's exactly the important yeah. point. Actually. I, yeah. yeah. 
So uh, another question, this is from Kay. Uh, could I see a copy of the peer-reviewed paper when available, please? Absolutely, yeah, it will be, uh, 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 I'm sorry, like it will be, we will public available. We will pay for everybody to, to uh, so we open source or um, public, uh, publicly available. Yeah, so I will, I will send it. Please get in touch, uh, maybe, you know, write your email and, you know, once it's there, it's hopefully the final review. Uh, not tough thing to get this uh, through, obviously, but no, yeah. A question that a couple of people have asked in different ways. I will go with the, I believe, the most recent one from Jenny is, uh, where can we try a demo version? What what is what is a, a researcher? Uh, what access do they have in terms of signing up for an account and actually examining and testing the yep. the, the approach that you, they would want? Uh, please sign up on advanced.com. Uh, you know, it's it's free in terms of uh, signing up and and testing everything. That's also an approach you want to convince people. Uh, by actually testing it and by by setting everything up and uh, and only once you would go for actual data recordings only then we should maybe talk about a license or so so lavance.com sign up we have live chat if any questions templates um it's very easy to get started onboarding is there as well uh -oh. Excellent. Uh, we have a question here that I think I'm going to put the answer, at least from our perspective at Prolific, uh, in the chat uh, window, which is what are example of bot checks? And what I'm going to do is in, in the uh, Casper, feel free to add on. This is a uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to copy this link, uh, folks. Uh, it's a, a blog post that we've put up on Prolific in all kinds of ways that we advise researchers uh, to, to deal with the potential of bots and or just uh, less than great participants. Uh, but Casper, if you want to add anything. Um, I think, so we have actually, we have like six or seven examples which you can just directly include in our, uh, in our what we have we call experiment library. Um, but yeah, like it's actually not too hard to do because a lot of the cognitive like tests, uh, there's, there's hardly any general bot that can do this. The important thing really to consider is just like if auto forwarding task, so things where basically, you know, a bot doesn't need to do anything. That is really a situation where we really have to think about it. But if you have like an end back task, you know, where it requires a certain sequence of responses, um, it, it's not going to happen. Um, and the other thing, which you know, I think is fair to do, is actually like if the task is easy enough to achieve uh, a certain score and you know people just are terrible and they just you know, make mistake after mistake um it's not only about bot uh, as philip said but it's just like it could be just a terrible participant who's just like doing like this right so um and and then for these kind of participants you can just you know let's say remove them and give them a, maybe a slightly less reward or so so that's another side of it right Here's a question from Jennifer. Can you elaborate more on the data saved at the user's server? How does the researcher receive the data then? So, um, well, again, it depends a bit on like, you know, like the, the traditional case, of course, is that uh, the, the data is all saved on our server. And um, we have improved a lot over the years and, you know, really, you know, listen to the community. The, the, the way this is currently done is that you can configure actually how the expo is going to be because there's not one answer that everybody likes. It's like some people want to have one file where all the participants are in. Somebody want to have a different file or different folder. Somebody have the, the binary data in there. Somebody not. Somebody wants a time series like that. So in short, it's configurable. Uh, there's a, such a tab called data export. And you select the data, the type of you know configuration, how you want it to export to work. Click download. That's it. Uh, this is a question that I believe you answered multiple times. We'll just put it up there. Um, LabVance, you don't offer participants like we do at Prolific, right? You use Prolific and you recommend us. Um, but so uh, LabVance is an alternative potentially to Qualtrics, Unipark, and these other uh, platforms. Exactly. Yes? Exactly. Yes. Okay, so let me ask you, uh, since uh, as a host, I, uh, and any question that's been asked that we don't get to in the remaining time, like I said earlier, will be sent uh, in the email, be answered by Casper Offline, uh, and you'll get the email with the link to the recording. Uh, also, please don't, uh, there's gonna be a feedback survey link in the chat. We'd love for you to complete that uh, and let us know what you think of the webinar. New webinars will be coming soon. If you go to prolifico forward slash webinars, you can sign up. For the webinar newsletter we'll let you know what else uh, we have for you there uh, but my question i think is just a bit broader which is i think you have a great platform as i said i think there's so much that's uh, advanced in this type of data collection online 
uh, in recent years. What, what do you see as the remaining challenges uh, for collecting high quality physiological eye tracking, et cetera, type of assessments? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, of course, the answer could be, you know, like uh, half an hour, but like, I think in a concise way. So one thing we're working on uh, in terms of eye tracking data is a lot of, there are some other tools that, that do this, but I think one thing that nobody really has on their agenda is, um, so to say, when you're talking about eye tracking data, um, you get basically raw gaze data out of the, out of the uh, neural network. The second step, which is very important, is actually to write a very good fixation detection algorithm. Because a lot of the metrics that are relevant, like time to first fixation, uh, fixation duration, number of fixations, all of this are fixation based. So, and this is another, another you know, algorithm, like clustering algorithm on top. And because the data from, a, from, you know, from working based eye tracking is very special, it's kind of low sampling rate, uh, you know, higher, higher dispersion, et cetera. It's not easy. You cannot just transport an existing algorithm and, and make it nice. We tried this. It's, so we have one in beta, which is okay, but it's already custom made. And so what we're actually doing, um, because in this comparison study, we gathered data from an iLink system, you know, which is, which is arguably really good and ours. And now we train a second neural network actually to basically match the iLink's clustering algorithm like based on our data it's or like that's uh, the short version of it so actually there <clears throat> there is another way to improve the the accuracy and even like uh uh you know given better data by going the second level metrics like fixation so that's one approach which is I think really important uh to consider it's probably going to be another paper because it's, it's actually quite complex another thing that i want to say and you know i didn't have time to cover all of this is there's of course other types of um physiologic that are really relevant and again Actually, both Levans and Prolific are you know, potentially important here. And one thing we are, you know, working on with you know two bigger clients of ours is actually to get, um, you know, fitness data. Uh, into, you know, co you know, uh, also like or combining, you know, uh, fitness data as well. Like, it's it's uh, it's a study where basically, you know, of course you have daily surveys and you know some some reaction time experiments and all of this. <clears throat> but you also want to see, okay, how much does participant, uh, how much did they move? How much did they sleep? Um, um, and it's, it's kind of important for uh, you know, a lot of research also in the uh, clinical domain. And there, there's this Google Fit API that can be accessed for this for because more and more people have, uh, and that's the important basis of it, have uh, wearables like smartwatches these days. And basically, of course, with consent, one can access this. And <clears throat> important this for this uh, is, of course, prolific because, again, there are pre-screeners for people who have those devices. So you can actually then make your study uh, participants. So you acquire, basically, people who have, let's say, a smartwatch so you can access this. And, um, you know, and then during the study, request, uh, you know, access to this type of data. Of course, you know, people should be rewarded for this um, appropriately to share this type of data. And, you know, you could do IRB and, you know, data a lot of data privacy aspects here, but I think this is this is really really um, helpful, and you know, it could could put research in in various domains. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I want to just be respectful of everyone's time and the uh, sort of the hour that we promised here. Once again, thank you for everyone who has remained and who came for the webinar today. Uh, all questions that have been asked that haven't been answered, we will answer them offline uh, in the email you receive within 24 hours. You also, in that email, get a link to the recording of this webinar, so you'll have access to all of uh, what Caspar has talked about today. And uh, once again, just thank you for coming. We really do appreciate it. Uh, please fill out the feedback survey. Let us know what you're thinking and sign up for the new webinars coming. Caspar, thank you thank very you much once again. Uh, it was for, a pleasure. Really yeah. nice. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Or good morning. <laughs> <laughs>